afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, my panelists. Uh, we really are happy to be here. We wish to thank uh, AMREF Africa for organizing this uh, African Health Agenda International Conference and honoring us women to be part of uh, the first uh, how, uh, session, uh, uh, among the first session on this uh, Women's International Day. We are delighted and we are honored. So without further ado, this is really a great conference for us. I would like to introduce very, very powerful women on this panel this afternoon. And uh, please uh, allow me to start with Edna Adan Ismail. Edna, Edna, a, a woman of great attributes. She is the founder of the Edna Adnan Hospital in Somaliland. And this hospital she built to improve women's health in, her, in the region, one of the highest mortality uh, maternal mortality rates in the world. Not only did she just build the hospital, she went on to build a university. This is uh, a, a, something, an achievement for us women. So kudos Edna. And she, was also, she also served as the first social affairs and family uh, welfare minister in Somaliland and later foreign minister in the year 2003 and 2006 as the only female minister in her government at that time, she used her position and she used it well to raise uh, and amplify the voices of women. So welcome Edna to this panel. Our next panelist, it's please welcome Professor Awa Marie Kosek. This uh, a woman of wonder, an engineer professor and researcher serving as a secretary general of African engineers uh, Dean's Council. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I will just call her Professor Awa Marie. Professor Awa Marie has done many. She's been a first in so many areas. She's currently leading the engineering intervention education program of the New Board Essential Solutions and Technologies, a program called NEST. She's also was the first female Dean uh, of Engineering in Malawi. Uh, at that Marawi University, the Polytechnic, Dr. Uh, uh, Teresa is a founding, sorry, it's not, the, uh, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Marie works in the field, I mixed Marie and, and, uh, and Dr. Teresa, sorry. I think I, I've got just too many of my important women going through my head. So Professor Marie works in the field of health and disease prevention in her country. She has served as the director of UNAIDS the Department of Policy, uh, Strategy and Research as a Minister of Health and Prevention in Senegal and is the author of 150 plus scientific uh, publications. And now, please welcome Professor Marie Kosek. Welcome, Marie. Uh, can I then introduce the engineer, Dr. Teresa Mukadawire. Dr. Mukadawire is a uh, the engineer and professor and researcher serving as secretary general of the African Engineering Dean's Council. She again started uh, the, the program for the newborn essential solutions and technologies, the NEST at the Polytechnic in Marawi, the university, the first female dean in that university. And she is a founding member of women engineering in Malawi and has been supporting and motivating girls and also boys in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, a program called STEM. The Estine Forlam awarded her for her outstanding valuable contribution and dedication to science, engineering, and technology to overcome adversity in 2018. Teresa has also served as the first vice president of Malawi Institution of Engineering. Now, Welcome, Teresa. Our next uh, uh, panelist is Sheila. Sheila Alumo is an ardent social entrepreneur, a shocker alumina. She is a lawyer by profession, passionate advocate for progressive rural community development at the grassroots level. She works solving community social problems and helps people to transform agro ecosystem and shape that mindset so that their, their programs can become 
a sustainable income generator, a program she calls FAB, that is farming as a business. We have Nicole as our next panelist. Nicole is a young CEO and founder of Medixas. This is a mobile, mobile app that connects health professionals with health professionals as they collaborate with patient cases. To date, in a, within a very short time, she has connected 1,000 patient handovers within uh, uh, the health professionals. She has combined her background of technology and uh, medicine, and she has tried in, the, uh, in this uh, app to improve healthcare system. She believes, and we all believe, if you are listening to an earlier uh, uh, speech by our CS minister, that communication is the key to drive change. Our next uh, panelist, Ruhi. Ruhi Sutawara is the CEO, this young people, CEO, and founder of Emas Limited, that is one of the first e-commerce enablers in the region. This company was founded five, four years ago, 2017. It helps uh, companies blood their man, and, uh, products, manufacturers, the retailers, startups, and they help, she helps them realize their full potential in e-commerce. She has uh, upper, uh, markets in 12 uh, markets in the country across Asia and Africa. Ruhi is also working as a consultant in development and implementation of electronic trade with Comesa. Welcome, Ruhi. And then we have Desiree. Desiree Jewel Adam, hi. A deputy director of communication and development for the African Women's Entrepreneurship Cooperative, a program hosted by the Center for Global Enterprise in New York. She's also the founder, director of development uh, of Startup uh, Africa, a boutique media communication and business development that supports small and medium-sized enterprises across Africa. So there you go. These are our panelists. Uh, we are expecting uh, Dr. Dr. Moeti. Uh, Dr. Eva, Dr. Moeti has joined oh, us. Yes, I've seen her. Dr. Moeti, welcome. <laughs> we were missing you. So, Dr. Moeti, welcome to join this Power of Women. She, uh, Dr. Moeti is the World Health Organization Regional Director for Africa and the first woman to occupy this position. Bravo, uh, Dr. Moeti. She, she's a medical doctor, public health expert with more than 40 years of national and international experience. So we're starting off, we don't have a lot of time, but I want you to give it your all. And I'll start with Dr. Moeti. Kindly tell us a little bit, share with us a little bit about yourself and why you think we are having this important uh, panel on Women's Day. Welcome, Dr. Moeti. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator, and uh, greetings to my fellow panelists and greetings to everyone attending this event. I'm so sorry to have joined late. I've traveled over the weekend and seem to have got my time zones confused. And that's a sign that I'm having a birthday in a couple of days that will bring me pretty close to 70 years. But I'm very pleased to join this um, very important event and I wish everybody a happy International Women's Day. All of us who are speaking here, all the women and all, uh, all the men. So my own innovation journey started, um, you know, when I was growing up in a township in uh, then apartheid South Africa. As a child, I felt the inequities of that terrible system and that has motivated me to redress unfairness and injustice in my work, in my career, in my interactions socially, et cetera. So it, it also was very much part of my family background. My, my mother was the eldest of seven girls. They didn't have any boys in, in the family who were educated though by her and my, my grandmother who was a teacher. And so I was surrounded by this group of very lively, creative, assertive, argumentative aunts who really have inspired me from when I was a child to death. 
and my parents as well, who both, both of whom were doctors initially, general practitioners in a South African township, created a very supportive environment as they brought up their family and supported a huge extended family. So they both had uh, very progressive ideas. For example, my dad, who was in private practice, was very interested in public health as a young man. And I was the first child in our township to get a BCG vaccination for tuberculosis. That was in the very early days of BCG. And my mom later in Botswana, because we migrated there, broke traditional taboos very much in her role, promoting family planning. And one of my first major challenges that I faced in my career was coordinating the response to the HIV AIDS epidemic in Botswana, which at that time had the highest burden of HIV globally. So as, as we know, there was huge injustice then with access to antiretroviral therapy for people in Africa. And when ARVs first became available in Africa, by that time working in WHO, my role was to help in rolling this out, a little bit like what we're doing, rolling out COVID-19 vaccines today, including convincing decision makers that um, nurses could be trusted to prescribe these drugs so that they could reach communities even where there were no doctors. I had to persevere and persuade authorities that this new tool and new ways of working were worth the investment and would save lives. And it was worth experimenting and trying this out. Since then, I've often had to push to achieve positive change. And this is something that I encourage all women, especially young women to do. And being the WHO Regional Director for Africa has given me a unique opportunity to advocate for early adoption of health innovations into practice and service delivery across the region. And I've set up a regional initiative dedicated to making this happen. So this started with our innovation challenge in 2018, in which women were one third of the 2,400 innovators who applied, and also a third of the top 30 who are now scaling up their innovations. So the talent and the capacity is there. We're working with countries now on policy gaps towards harnessing the demographic dividends of Africa's young population. And I'm always so impressed by young Africans' creativity and innovation. And also we're promoting smart investments in information technology to help to fast track sustainable development on our continent. Mainstreaming the participation of women, I think is key to ensuring innovations are not gender blind or gender biased, which can further compound existing inequities. This includes making available funding to encourage women's participation in the innovation space. So I'm also working with my team to change WHO in Africa from a male dominated workplace. This is very much a work in progress. We're striving for gender parity in our staffing, providing leadership training, for our women staff, bringing on board more young women from the Global South in partnership with the UN Volunteers Program, and we've introduced a mentoring program for and by women. As I progressed up through the ranks, I have to say I had several mentors who were men, and my experience has been that men can be powerful supporters and enablers of gender equality, and I'm determined to motivate my male colleagues as well to do this. Most of all, I want to encourage young women to be active in creating the world that you want to live in. If you see a problem and you have an idea about a solution, and I know young women have got many, many ideas about solutions, go for it and try, try it and bring other people along with you. If we create environments where everyone can contribute their ideas, and particularly if women are given the space and the right tools to unleash their creativity and their ingenuity, the world will hugely benefit. So again, thank you so much for having invited me to this panel and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Moet. It is great to have uh, one of us at the policy decision table, uh, policy making uh, and the decision making table because when you are there, you represent us and we make sure that we are not left behind. And I'm glad that you are pushing to change the, the, the position for WHO Africa so that you get more women to uh, work with you on this journey as we get more of us on that table. Thank you so much. 
I would like to uh, welcome Edna, Edna Adan Ismail. Kindly take us through your story uh, and let us know how you've done all these great things. And uh, it's wonderful to have you, Edna. Thank you very much, Eva. And hello to everybody who's participating. Uh, a special hello to my colleague, uh, Dr. Machidiso. Uh, the first time we have a, a female, a woman, uh, WHO regional director, which is a great privilege. Uh, when I was WHO representative, I was the only female WHO representative in Emero. And we thought that was a great thing. This is even a greater thing. So I am so uh, excited that good changes are happening. Uh, my name is Edna Adan Ismail. I'm from Somaliland, the Horn of Africa, a former British uh, protectorate. I'm a nurse by profession and uh, the daughter of the first uh, senior medical health professional in my country, trained in England as a nurse and a midwife and returned to my country in 1961 as its first qualified nurse midwife. Now this placed a very heavy responsibility upon my shoulders. Uh, the Horn of Africa, of course, is, is, is a part of the world where healthcare is not as it should be, as we would wish it to be. And I began to, to train other nurses and train midwives, married, uh, had joined WHO 1965. Uh, and this is the privileges I've had, the experiences, the training and the opportunities I've had were leading me to my country, Somaliland, when I retired from WHO 24 years ago. So Dr. Machidi, so 70 is a great age. I was 70, 14 years ago. So look forward to it. It's a great age. Um, with all the privileges I had, and in 1997, when I retired, the Horn of Africa was going through so many um, worrying, disturbing experiences. And I thought the best thing I could do is I can, I'm going to focus on doing something for women. This is what I know. This is what I've been teaching. This is what I've been practicing. Global health, public health, community health, midwifery, maternal and child health. So this is what I will focus upon. So I returned for 24 years ago and built a hospital. Uh, this is where I am living now. I've been living here for 20 years. It took me four years to build it and started training people because it's not the buildings, it's not the bricks and the mortar that looks after the sick. It's the skills and the competence of health pro professionals. Um, 10 years later, I built a university. Uh, we started with, with certificate level training, uh, diploma level. Now we do the degrees and we're aiming for master's programs. Uh, my wish, my intention is to train as many health professionals from my country, uh, as many as I can because this is what will change the, uh, the potential of health for my people. Maternal mortality in my country, Somaliland, is one of the highest. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. It's a country that is not even on your map because it is not politically recognized. We're neighbors to Somalia, which everybody knows about for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but in spite of that, Somaliland is a country that has been peaceful and stable for 30 years, and that is why I have been living here for 24. Today, I'm proud that my university has 1,500 students in medicine and dentistry and public health and nursing and midwifery, and 70% of the students are female. Not because we discriminate against males, but because the subjects we teach, midwifery, is 100% taught to women. Nursing, 80% of the students in nursing are, are female. Uh, in the other professions, in medicine, in fact, uh, the, the, the uh, junior years are mostly female, 70%, 65% are female. Um, we're excited that we have women surgeons, women pediatricians, women anesthetists, and in a day when in the shift there is a female surgeon who is operating 
assisted by a female anesthetist, assisted by a, a female instrument nurse in an operating theater that has a female supervisor in a hospital that was built by a woman and the patient on the table who we are all putting our energy together and, and skills and knowledge together to save is a male patient. Now, this is what human collaboration is all about. And what I would like to stress to the, to, the, um, to the generation that follows us, to the young generation of today, that Women's Day is a great day, yes, but it's not commemorating a day in a calendar. It's what we do. It's how we contribute to the community. It's the role models, models we become, the examples we give, and the contributions we make to save human lives. And of course, one of the things that I, I, I always like to, to stress is that when we want change, we, don't, we, we negotiate for it. Violence never gets us anywhere. We campaign for it, we lobby for it, we appeal for it, we demonstrate how it can change and, and the benefit it will have to, you know, for everybody. And we become people who become trusted and then given the responsibilities and, and the change that we want come our way. Today, women have the vote in my country. We have, I think, five female ministers. We have women uh, uh, lawyers. We have women engineers. We didn't have that 60, 70 years ago. And it all comes with determination. It all comes with having a focus wanting to do something that is good for everybody, not only women, what's good for women, it's good for everybody. And working towards it and showing uh, the, 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 the changes that women make, the positive changes that women make when they are given the opportunity to lead, to share, to participate, and to join efforts that change the, 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 the potential of health and education for the community. Um, this is what I would like to share with everybody. And today I am so blessed. I feel that whatever I have put into this was worth it a thousand times. This patient we, the, we have treated, the, the conditions that we have come across, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I feel that I have been given a blessing rather than me giving something. What I have given was just you know, just material. What I have gained is the satisfaction of knowing that if I were to leave tomorrow, I'm leaving a bunch of people who will carry that torch forward and who will practice that skill that we have taught them with determination and professionalism, but also with compassion and respect for human life and human dignity. Um, I'm, I would be happy to answer more questions, but in general, this is what I would like to, to share with you. And if a woman like me, a 74 year old, 84 year old woman in Somaliland can run a hospital and run a university at the same time, anybody can do it. And tomorrow, God willing, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the hospital where we have Yay. delivered over 28,000 babies and mm. thousands of patients that we have treated. This is the landmark of what mm. the effort has brought. So thank you for this opportunity and never give up. Giving up is never an option. It's not an option. The opportunities that work is what you should look for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Edna. Thank you, you are an iron ready and you are an inspiration to many of us in this region and well done. And we will be congratulating you and uh, celebrating with you tomorrow as you celebrate the many years of the achievement. Thank you and thank you. I'm sure there'll be many, many uh, questions and comments coming our way. Please let me go quickly because we want to utilize our time fully. I want to listen to all of you all of you women, I want to listen to Professor Awa Marie call. Let's please take uh, our, our five minutes and let everybody uh, be able to share with our stories. Uh, Professor Marie. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, and I am very happy to be part of uh, this very important panel where I am seeing a lot of friends and uh, sister. I would like just to, to tell you that uh, I have been uh, all my life, I can say, um, since I was a small girl, thinking that I would like to help my people and I would like to be a doctor. And this is not uh, something came by the way, it was something in my heart. Since the beginning, I understand things and everywhere, every time I was asking for something, I was asking for something linked to the doctor I wanted to be. And uh, when I, uh, I also come from a family, father, doctor, mother, teacher. And it is not uh, maybe something uh, strange that I, because I went to the university as a doctor and I continue with a career of a teacher until I had the grade of a professor with a, as an MD, PhD. And uh, I had a, a very important career clinically in my own country and went at international level where I uh, met some people like Moeti and uh, happy to see her again today. And say, all of my life, uh, innovation has been something very important and at the center of the activity I had. Uh, at international level, we remember this was very important when I was in UNAID, the issue of access to uh, medication, uh, antiretroviral, which was not something in Africa very uh, uh, people were saying often. And we were fighting to have uh, medication uh, at a price people from Africa was able to, to have. And it is where we were fighting for generics, et cetera. And I think that this was innovation at this time. By being also in rollback malaria, all the new nets, which was not uh, uh, something we had before, uh, with imprinted uh, treated nets was rolled out everywhere. And there also we were, uh, it was an innovation with rapid diagnostic test for malaria. In Senegal, when I came as minister twice, but I give just the example of introducing new vaccines, but also trying to really help women with the contraception because we were at a level so so low of cover 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 uh, of uh, prevalence of uh, our our women with uh, contraception that it was one of my priority. And it is where also we innovate and uh, have uh, some things to do there. I would like to tell you that today, because I want to be <laughs> quick, you told me that I have to speak quickly. I want to say that uh, today I am uh, uh, leading an initiative, of the Gallian Forum, where we are calling uh, uh, and inviting young uh, students at the end of their uh, uh, career of student and the best one. And it is why I'm asking to, to say that to Edna because this will be uh, uh, for me uh, an opportunity to invite you because you have hospital and university to have some of your best uh, student come into Senegal uh, in general is in December. And we are, uh, giving them some uh, introduction to leadership, but also entrepreneurship and put them in contact sometime with investors. And this is very important because innovation is good, but you need to have the money or the people who help you to do that. I would like also to say another point. I am in juries of young innovators, and this is also an opportunity for, for me to work on innovation. Uh, I like innovation. I think that if we want uh, to build today the Africa we want, we need to innovate. We need to use innovation. And STEAM for women is something important. And I am also pushing that very much 
to have them together. And this is an opportunity for, for us today to have this panel with all this movement and we will networking, we will do a network to ensure that we can help each other. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, this was great, and uh, the fact that you are inviting the less the uh, women from Africa to come to your uh, institution, this is fantastic. And this is now collaboration. We are going to work in Africa as continents, and this is the beginning of a very powerful women's group that will collaborate and join hands to strengthen ourselves. Let me move quickly uh, to Professor Teresa. Professor Teresa, please kindly, uh, you have five minutes to share with us your, your story. And I know you are, you are a professor, you keep time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So I am Teresa Mkandawire from Malawi. Uh, briefly, uh, my background, my journey. Um, so I grew up in the village. I didn't have pro models but I was very hardworking uh, and passionate to contributing to solving problems. And so the picture that you're seeing um, depicts a scenario during my bachelor's degree in civil engineering, where I was the only female student in class, but I excelled. My secret, I looked at myself just like any other student. I didn't look at myself as the only female student. And so my advice to girls and women out there is work hard and be focused. Next slide. So why we are here today, women in innovation, I want to share with you two challenges that we are facing. And this is um, a challenge in ending preventable deaths in newborns. Across Africa, 1 million babies die every year from three main causes. These are prematurity, infection, and lack of uh, breath at birth. 75% of these deaths are preventable with appropriate services and equipment. Next slide. So the other challenge that we face in Africa is that uh, most of the equipment we have, either in the health sector or other sectors, it's donated. It's manufactured elsewhere. We lack spare parts. We don't have um, capacity, we don't have resources uh, to maintain these equipments. They're not meant for our harsh environments with frequent power interruptions. Um, our environments are humid, are dusty. So the donated equipment will only work for a short while and it breaks down. And so by the end of the day, you see piles and piles of broken down equipment in different sectors. Next slide. So I work with a program called NEST, which is Newborn Essential Solutions and Technologies, which is innovating a new model to prevent newborn deaths that works to deliver and sustain medical technologies and strengthen health systems. Next slide. So the NEST program has many components, but I lead the invention education program for NEST to build an ecosystem that fosters innovation. So we do this through two main strategies. Uh, we build capacity of the people, the staff and students through curriculum review and changing mode of delivery, but also we provide supporting systems. We provide design space to enable students to innovate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Please, can we move the slides a little bit fast? Uh, whoever is helping, uh, Teresa, Natra. Next slide. Uh, uh, Teresa, maybe you can speak through even without slides so that okay. we, we save time. Let, let just, okay, let please. me just continue. So yeah, please we, just we continue, have yeah. We have changed the educational approach from instructor-centered to student-centered approach. So we've built design studios. These are design spaces which are equipped with uh, equipment such as 3D printers and laser cutters to enable the students uh, prototype their ideas. 
And we also have a global, uh, a global internship program where students from different uh, universities collaborate to work on our technologies uh, to solve the, the challenges. So um, the picture that you're seeing uh, there is uh, the students working in teams from different countries, sharing experiences and designing technologies on internships and they're working in the design studios. Next slide. So we also connect our students to community, to investors, to hospitals and local industries. Next slide. So we have really seen a huge impact in that um, the change in the engineering education curricula, the change in mode of delivery, providing the support systems, the design spaces, the equipment, the training has had a huge impact. Already we are developing a pipeline of inventors and we're already seeing some technologies on the ground. So for example, the, the first uh, picture you're seeing on my left is the phototherapy light that treats jaundice in babies. This one was designed by staff and students at the Malawi Polytechnic and it's in use in all hospitals. We're also able to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with our low uh, manufacturing capacity, we could not get some PPEs. We were able to leverage um, the design studios to manufacture uh, personal protective equipment. And we also offer training uh, to students, staff, and community. Next slide. So um, this is uh, what we do. Uh, and if we are to build Africa, then we have to innovate. That's the only way to go. And if you want to know more about NEST, you can visit uh, www.nest360.org. Thank you. Dr. Eva, you're on mute. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Teresa. And that was very enlightening. I like your program, uh, The Nest, and I'm sure you, we shall be asking you more questions uh, towards the end. I'd like to quickly go to Sheila. Sheila Alumo, please, uh, can you share your story with us? Sheila. Sheila, unmute yourself, uh, Sheila. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I am unmuted. Um, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Eva. And, uh, <laughs> And once again, I am honored to be part of this panel, you know, very amazing women. Uh, uh, just a bit of background. I am uh, a founder and CEO, of Eastern Agriculture Development Company Limited, an agribusiness company working with over 3,000 smallholder farmers in the far too rich areas. We are in the business of changing systems and transforming livelihoods. So basically, I am a systems and food innovator in a nutshell. And uh, this we do through creating business opportunity for the poor rural smallholder farmers, uh, innovating through um, making access to finance available by especially the unbankable rural smallholder farmers, and also innovating through food uh, processing. And we're trying to bring back traditional foods back to the table. And this we are doing by proce uh, processing nutritive foods that cater to the needs of especially the BOP, uh, bottom of the pyramid, you know, uh, malnourished populations. Uh, but basically a, a bit of background, my, my entrepreneurship journey started about 11 years ago, you know, and um, I was, you know, just like I think many of us here at some point in life have experienced loss. So I, you know, lost my mother. And um, at 11 years of age, um, I was forced to become a mother, not by birth, but uh, uh, I had two young siblings that were left behind, one 11, I mean, one uh, five years old and the youngest being one year old. And as a young, as a young girl, of course, um, I, we faced hardship growing up, you know, as a child. And I, I, I know so many people in my position faced the same challenges and hardships. And, and this I could relate through the communities in which we're working in. But most importantly, these unfortunate events, you know, propelled me to be the person that I am today. 
I mean, at that age, I had to fend for my little siblings because due to the unfortunate events, my father, um, you know, I don't know, couldn't take the passing of our mom. So he lost his job and we were faced, you know, with um, the possibility of being homeless and uh, the possibility of going hungry. So at that age, you know, it struck me and I started a business. <laughs> if you're from Africa, maybe you can relate. And I was selling sugarcane, you know, I would move several kilometers, about five to the nearest sugarcane plantation, buy sugarcane, bring it to the nearest center, sell it so I could get, you know, some little money to provide for my little sibling. So what am I saying this? Uh, the basis of what I am doing, you know, is the foundation from where I started from. The circumstances in my life, you know, that, you know, made me the person that I am today. And I realized, you know, growing up that I am not the only one facing these challenges. There's so many child-headed families and homes out there that don't have the opportunities. Fortunately, my father was able to find a job and was able to take us through school, give us the best of education. And, you know, through that, I was able to, you know, I, I gained so many opportunities and I was able to channel back, you know, all that energy and positivity back to transforming the communities because um, there are so many, you know, challenges in communities that I could resonate with. I know what, it's mean, what it means to be hungry. I know what it means to, you know, not have hope. I know what it means to not have food. And I thought as a young girl that I needed to make a difference in society. And that is why I started my company, Eastern Agricultural Development Company. We give hope to the hopeless and, you know, we are transforming systems, especially, you know, for the um, smallholder farmers that have no opportunities and building sustainable market solutions for them. And I must say that, you know, this is something that we are doing this through collaboration, of course, with several partners that we're working with. And I must say that this is something that, you know, we can't do alone, but if all of us joined forces, joined hands, we can all make a difference or create a difference to communities and society. And for the young people out there starting out in life, you know, I would encourage you all that, you know, our backgrounds do not define us, but, you know, our um, resilience, focus, and thought process defines us. And keep your eyes, you know, to the goal. I mean, keep your eyes to the price, because evidently, regardless of the challenges and circumstances in life, you know, we can all make it and, you know, make this world a better place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. That's really inspiring, the, the story and the journey. And uh, I know uh, what you've achieved so far. We are really proud. You are uh, an uh, inspiration to so many of the young women as well. So can I please now invite uh, Nicole? Nicole, uh, please, can I give you, we have only a few minutes and I want the uh, three of you young entrepreneurs and the uh, young women of uh, substance to tell us at least in three minutes what your story is about. Nicole. Hello. Yes, sure. Sorry, I'm, I'm now on my phone because I had a power cut here, so um, <laughs> in true fashion. So um, yes, my name is Nicole Kayade. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Medixis. Um, we are a, a healthcare platform that connects medics across the continent um, to collaborate in real time on patient cases. Um, we also help organizations run more efficiently through data insights um, into sort of, you know, time to discharge patient outcomes um, and how they can overall improve the sort of quality offering um, for, for their facilities. Um, I'm Nigerian by, by birth um, and I started Medixis um, largely because uh, as most Africans have the same story, um, I lost a loved one due to sort of uh, what I would call inadequate care. And what struck me when my sister, who's a doctor as well, was talk we were talking to the, um, the doctor um, in, in the facility in Nigeria and he kept telling us, I don't know, or I'm not sure how. Um, and the idea from Dixus was really born in the moment that we found out that our relative had passed away. I thought, why doesn't he know? Why doesn't he have someone to ask? 
And why do people die because of that? Um, it doesn't make the healthcare workers feel good. It doesn't make the families feel good. Um, and it means that it erodes trust in our local healthcare system. And that's why um, some presidents who won't be named disappear for months at a time uh, to get healthcare abroad um, because trust in our local systems have been eroded. Um, and so for me, Medixus was really the idea that we can, there's a very simple solution to a problem like this, which is if we can harness all the knowledge that exists on the continent, all the medical knowledge, and put that in the pocket of every healthcare worker on the continent, um, then we can empower people to make better clinical decisions based on the patients they see in front of them um, which leads to better patient outcomes and also of course um, also hopefully better working conditions in some sense for the clinicians um, who are less likely to burn out and, and subsequently leave. Um, so that's largely the, the inception of Medixus um, and, and why we exist. We, we, I often say it, but I think ineffective communication in a healthcare context mm. costs lives and effective mm. communication saves them. Um, and we exist to give people a conduit for effective communication um, and, and, and make a difference mm. to, yeah, to the quality of care that all patients get, regardless of where they are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Precise and to the point and very articulate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that's why you are rising to the top as a CEO and your company, I'm sure, is going to uh, connect many medics in the continent. Luhi, Luhi Sutawara, please just be as brief as Nicole, and I know you'll be able to do this. Go Thank on. you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eva. I'm so privileged to be um, amongst these great women on our panel. Thank you so much. Uh, for me, I've, uh, I'm Ruiz Atarwala, as you know. Uh, I've been driving innovation on the continent through a simple tool that's e-commerce. I started a technology company when I was 32 years, years old with zero knowledge of technology. And I mean, as Dr. Moiti mentioned, if you have an idea and you believe that the idea can change your life for good and life of people around you for good, then I think you should go for it, irrespective of your age, irrespective of your gender, irrespective of the way you look. If you have the idea, if you have certain resources that you can make the idea become reality and change, change lives for better, I think you should go for it. What drove me to, uh, e to look at e-commerce as a tool for changing lives across on this continent was uh, something similar to what Teresa mentioned before, that a lot of brands and a lot of companies have been using Africa as a second market after you know, their products have been used and experimented in other countries. You know Now it's time for Africa. And it's sad because Africa as a continent is full of resources. It's full of knowledge it's full of passion it's full of passionate people so to harness that it was important to make the voice of small and medium enterprise uh, owners be heard amongst the crowd of uh, different brands that are rushing and racing to enter Africa and to now make use of a mature market so, so uh, driven by uh, this market gap wherein we have people who are producing beautiful goods and uh, useful goods in a race with uh, people who have deep uh, pockets um, and bigger enterprises who've been rushing to create market space in Africa. What we did is we empowered uh, women and small and medium enterprises with knowledge on how to market their goods better. In terms of policy changes, I mean, it's something uh, to all the women in power position was, is my request to not only uh, enable women's uh, women-led enterprises uh, just by providing resources, but it's also by providing a lot of knowledge in terms of uh, not just how to make a good product, but also how to package it better, how to market it better, how to sell it better, and not to compromise simply on the basis that it's a local product, so it should be cheaper than something international. I mean, you should hold your ground and you should support your product and the idea towards the end. Thank you, thank you. That's a quick introduction from my side. Young ladies, you are all innovators and uh, communication is uh, uh, quite a strong attribute for all of you. Desari Adam, please, you thank have you, a Dr. few minutes Eva. to yes. tell us about yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Eva. And like everyone said, I'm just, I'm so excited to be in the, in the room with such greatness. Um, so I'm Desiree and I'm representing, well, I'm wearing two hats today. As an entrepreneur, the founder of Startup Africa, I created it simply to tell the stories of women like yourselves and entrepreneurs across Africa, because I feel like those stories are not being told. Um, so this is one of the, the things I do, but I'm also here representing the African Women Entrepreneurship Cooperative 
AWEC for short, and that is a, a leadership and business development uh, program that builds the capacity of and empowers African women entrepreneurs. The program is hosted by the Center for Global Enterprise, which is based in New York. It's a US nonprofit that gives 12 month scholarships every year to 200 women from all across the continent. And this year we were fortunate to have received over 2,600 applications from 45 countries. I myself was very fortunate to be a beneficiary of this transforming um, program. Um, at the same time, one might ask, so what's innovative about it? Well, in my view, innovation sometimes means doing old things in a new way. And what AWEC has literally done is taken the principle of a very, very well-known African proverb, it takes a village. They've taken that proverb and infused it into the technology of the learning program and the platform that we have. They allow that to be the premise upon which the ecosystem is built. They leverage design thinking or human-centered design, should I say, which places us as the entrepreneurs at the core and center of the program. They then collaborate with stakeholders from all spheres, like this platform and many more, private, public, business, and academia, who then support, facilitate, and feed the ecosystem. Throughout the 12 months, the entrepreneurs themselves are drawing from the strength of the ecosystem in order to build their resilient businesses. I will talk about three challenges that we like to address, or we say we like to address, is capacity building skills that go beyond the theoretical. All the courses on the program allow everyone to apply everything that they've learned. The second thing is a network that gets it. So a network that understands the nuances of the culture. And the third thing, we pay mind to the fact that women don't always have the opportunity to drop everything and go. And so the program is designed with that in mind. They don't have to step away from their businesses or their families to participate. They do the majority of the work on their own and the content is delivered in small monthly doses so, so they don't feel overwhelmed and feel like it's difficult to implement. I've been fortunate to be part of the program. And I guess what I would say to everyone as, as everyone has spoken today is, you know, entrepreneurship and the journeys that we have is tough. There's hurdles and there's challenges we have to face, but the hope is we have spaces like these we have opportunities like these. We have IFPMA who are supporting this. This we have, you know, ICC and women like yourselves. Grab every opportunity that is available to you. Thank you, Dr. Eva. Thank you, Desiree. And you've said it: empower one woman, empower women, and you empower a nation. You empower the globe, and we empower our continent. Thank you. Thank you, a very very powerful ladies. And now you've mentioned IFPMA, they've been the ones sponsoring this panel and I thank them. And I'd like to ask Kamau, who is with us, please kindly highlight one or two of the questions that uh, uh, our panelists uh, can, can take because I know we have only a few minutes. Uh, Kamau, I would like you to please uh, uh, raise the questions and I can see you are on, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eva, and thank you to our wonderful panel. Uh, it's it's amazing each and everyone's journey um is is inspirational uh what you are doing uh is brilliant i would just very quickly like to thank our co-sponsors as well the international chamber of commerce the global ip center from the u.s chamber and innovation council we do have a few questions uh some of them have been answered but i will uh so they are uh, to Mrs. Edna and Dr. Moiti about what are the challenges that you faced in your leadership journey? Uh, what are the biggest challenges in finding solutions in women, women health problem? How can we bring men on board? That I think should be for the entire panel. And how can we innovate, innovatively inspire young men to be champions? Um, there's also a question on how do you uh, address the financial situations that uh, some of you have highlighted. Uh, these are the three questions we have. We have one hand raised. I am not sure if the attendees can, can speak, but if we could go through these questions first, uh, that would be wonderful. So 
Um, can we start with Mrs. Edna and then go to Dr. Moiti, please, first? Yes, well, thank you very much. Life has challenges. Um, there's nobody without challenges, but then you learn to focus on what you can do. I know we dream big. Uh, when I wanted to build a hospital, I didn't want to build a hospital this size. I wanted to build a small hospital within the limits of my resources. And then it just grew. And then I expanded it. So dream big, but then undertake what part of that dream that you can start and finish. Don't start something that you cannot finish because people will then say, you see, you couldn't do it. We told you so. They will be so quick with, with discouragements. Uh, the other thing, it's always financial and it's also obstruction and, and it's lack of confidence of women themselves to say, oh no, no, this is too difficult for me. Oh, this is gonna need a man to do it. Have confidence in yourself. You're a person. The man is a person. Some have potential, others don't. Women have potential, someone may not. You are an individual. Use your potential, your resources and build your dream within that and never get discouraged because simply because 99% of people have said, oh, you can do that. You, 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 know, you, you, you know, don't, don't get discouraged. So this is very quickly what I can say. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists and the organizers. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. You've, yeah, thank you, Edna. You've answered, and I've seen you've actually been answering the questions on the chat. So most of uh, the questions that are addressed to you have been answered. So Kamau, if, uh, if you look at the, the question Q and A, uh, Edna has answered most of the questions. So uh, yeah. I would like yeah, Dr. Moet uh, maybe to answer uh, one of the remaining questions because I know we are, we are going to be running out of time in a few minutes. Yeah, we have one minute. I'll give the mm. floor to Dr. Moeti. Mm. Yes. Uh, I just have, Ruhi, can you just check the Q&A to answer the question on e-commerce? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I'll attempt with great humility to answer the questions, how can you bring men on board, which was, which is a question, Kamal, that you said was for everybody, which I'm sure we've all wrestled with and organized over and tried in different ways. Um, I mean, certainly, I think one of the things is to help men to understand how this is to their benefit as well. You know, that, 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 that women's achievements, women's potential being realized benefits families, benefits other people's businesses, benefits our countries, and benefits the objectives and the ambitions of political leaders who are mostly men. If only that we work together so as not to lose out on the talent, the ingenuity, the energy, the flexibility of, of women. And then to reassure them that this is not a win or lose game, that this is a win-win situation. I, I do that with my colleagues all the time. I can see as our program on bringing women on board, empowering women, gain some momentum, some sort of reticence and shrinking and worrying. And I get sometimes informal information from other colleagues that, oh, she's all about women now. Uh, you know, so, so not wishing to appease this because we can't fall into the trap, surely, of uh, you know, reassuring and the, the powerful. Because even my junior colleagues in WHO in the ecosystem of our organization are powerful in relation to women, are recognized, are validated, more than the women, but trying to bring them on board as partners and helping them understand this is for our mutual benefit. And sometimes we appeal, you know, you've got daughters, this is for your daughter's benefit. You've got women in your family. So trying to do all of that, uh, you know, both in terms of their policy role and their appealing to their humanity sometimes, somehow without appeasing mm -hmm. the resistance mm -hmm. and helping them understand mm -hmm. the win-win. And then progressively finding champions. I think we must find some champions who have mm -hmm. the, the, the conviction and the courage to come out. Some people, some mm -hmm. men have to spontaneously embrace this as part of their agenda as well, working with us as, as long as they are not then expecting women to fit into that little box of being done a favor. And it's really a work in progress. It's not easy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moet. Excellent. I I, Kamau, you must agree with me that uh, these are uh, uh, inspirational 
and uh, uh, iconic ladies. And I would like to ask this, we have the senior ones, please hold the hearts of the younger ones that are looking up to you so that we pull them up through this uh, journey as they want, uh, they make an impact in their fields. So I, I want to thank all of you, each one of you, you've just made this session excellent. And I would like to thank IFPMA, Kamau and your team for hosting us and uh, sponsoring us. And I would like to thank Amle for this uh, international conference that is really bringing forward the health agenda in Africa. And I'm looking forward to having all of you participating in the remaining sessions so that you can also see what the others are saying. Yes, women, we are a power. And as Dr. Moet said, let's get men to support us so that they can also, we can convince them of our agenda and what it is that we are powerful. And also they need to know that without us, they are not really going to succeed. I think they need us and we need them as well. Thank you so, so much. Kamal, I let you say the final word as our sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eva, and thank you, everyone. It, it has been my honor to get to know you. I apologize, we only had one hour, but please know this is not of the last. This is just first of this series. You're an inspiration to all, whether you're 30 or you're 84, it really does not matter. So thank you so much. And uh, we will continue this conversation. We will be in touch. Uh, and it's just, it's been a privilege and an honor. And Dr. Moiti, thank you. I know you're on different time zones. Uh, <clears throat> I know my boss, who was actually the inspiration of, of this panel, uh, he is a gentleman and he reminded me that men are also women's champion. I think if we have the support, if we are inclusive, if we collaborate, if we innovate, we will find solutions for the problems we are facing. Thank you so much. It has been my honor and privilege to have met you and to know you the last few months. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank and, you, ladies. And goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Happy, happy, happy International Women's Day. Happy Women's Day. Happy Women's Day, all. <laughs> and thank you for making us proud. Thank you. Great.